Okay, this is the part of the day where we invite all the product managers and engineers up to um, answer your questions. So if you have any, I know I almost asked you to come back up, Rob. You know. And speakers, so you're welcome to come up. Um, and does anybody have any questions? I know it's been a lot of content, a lot of great information. Okay, if there aren't any questions, do you have a question? Absolutely. Yeah, so I have a question in terms of uh, uh, long-term support of the releases, because uh, everything nowadays moves so fast. Uh, the Kubernetes releases are so fast. At the same time, our customers want support for years, not months. And so we struggle to provide uh, enough support uh, for enough years because the underlying platform moves. And we have seen, uh, for example, uh, uh, that in the past, Kubernetes tried to have a long-term support and then it ended nowhere. And I've seen that it's sort of coming back. There is seen some discussion about uh, reintroducing long-term support nowadays. So I was curious, in OpenShift, uh, how is uh, the long-term support going? So that is a great question. Um, long-term support, this is something that OpenShift has been looking at for a long time. And in fact, in the upstream, there's a new working group within the CNCF looking at long-term support, so for Kubernetes. Um, and there is a questionnaire that's being worked out right now that it would be great if you, um, I'll send it out with the presentations, but it'd be great for you to give your feedback too for that working group. So we look at it not only for OpenShift platform, we work closely with the other partners, vendors, um, that look at long-term support too. Microsoft's involved, Google's involved, um, a lot of other companies. So, um, that, that's a great question. And it's being looked at continually. So, thank you. Any other questions? Think of some more, you have some good ones. Hi. Um, so, in our organization, we've tried really hard to leverage security features in OpenShift and ACS and compliance operator to make sure that we have hardened clusters. What we found though is that the more that we try to harden by default, the harder it is to, and the longer lead time there is to creating those clusters. Um, one of the presentations had discussed the compliance operator and additional compliance or hardening standards. And to my knowledge though, there's not a way to day zero build a cluster that's hardened to a particular standard. So I was wondering, am I incorrect about that? And if I'm not incorrect about that, are there any plans to enable that? This might be one that Chuck can actually answer. This is, I know. It's, <laughs> um, secure a cluster by default when you, to certain standards, I would think FedRAMP or so, uh, Chuck Sibley, I work for Red Hat. I run our cloud services go to market. Um, so, you look at Azure Red Hat OpenShift, which is our OpenShift cloud service in, in Arrow. Just by spinning up Arrow, you automatically um, are getting certification out of box like HIPAA, PCI DSS compliance, things like that. Generally speaking, and remember, OpenShift installs on infrastructure, consumes you know, compute, network storage, et cetera. So to actually get that compliance, get the certifications, um, you have to do a lot more than just the OpenShift itself. So the cloud service is something that it, we're building on a secured environment already or something that's already compliant, something that's already certified. And then so we benefit from that. Um, there are things you can do with self-managed OpenShift uh, so OCP, OpenShift Container Platform, OpenShift Platform Plus, OpenShift Container Engine, which is our cube distro. Uh, they'll get you part of the way there, but it doesn't take care of all the underlying infra that gets you the full picture. Um, long story short, generally speaking, it's a cloud service that will get you 
pretty far down, down that road, or, or, or far enough, I guess you could say. That answer your question? Yes. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? This is usually when it just gets started. All right, we still have Brad here, Watson X, AI questions. Any software supply chain? No? Okay, because the, uh, the beer and the wine's not gonna be out until five, so. <laughs> I know, unless we can convince them to put it out early. Would anybody like to share any stories? I don't know. You always have a story, Frank. <laughs> Is it a good one? So if you don't know Frank, I know we've heard from him a lot today, but he uh, runs a podcast. It's called Frank's World, and it's amazing. So definitely sign up for that. And he's already put out some podcasts from today. Um, so what do you hear most often? Oh, and he is also a Microsoft MVP. So no, Chuck just mentioned ARO. So if you have Microsoft questions, Frank's your guy as well. Um, but what do you hear more stuff in? I think one of the things that's been kind of a surprise is the require the, the impact of data gravity and data sovereignty on where companies are running or doing the training at least of their AI solutions. Right? I, when I was in Microsoft, everything was cloud this, cloud that. But I think when push comes to shove, organizations are very hesitant to put any data or mass quantities of data into any hyperscaler. Because um, you, know, you can check out any time you want, but you never really can leave. You know, the egress charges are not trivial if you have mass quantities of data. So usually when that does happen, there's buy-in from very high up in the organization to say, okay, we're going all in on cloud X or cloud Y. Um, that's, that's the exception rather than the rule. I think um, the model that we particularly um, enable kind of all up is, is, is the fact that you can train wherever your data is. So you bring the compute to wherever your data is. And then the models themselves are you know, even ChatGPT, no one really knows exactly how big that model is, but let's just say it's 10 gigs. That's still less than everything ever written in the English language or any other language, right? It's still pretty small. It's a distillation of all the data out there, um, and linguistically anyway. Uh, so the models themselves tend to be actually pretty, pretty small. And those are way more portable. So do you see a lot of multi-cloud? Absolutely, I think multi-cloud's the future. Uh, who here has multi-cloud architectures? Yeah? What, I saw some maybes. <laughs> okay, so on-prem and AWS. And it's a little Azure. Okay. Due to vendor, due to concerns about vendor lock-in as well as pricing. Not currently. Currently, it has to do more with integrations and things like that. Does it have anything to do with a service that's available in one cloud and not in the other? Yes. Okay, that makes sense. That's actually a really good reason to do it. Um, what we find typically is that a decentralized IT strategy provides an insane amount of drift where line of businesses and dev teams are permitted to just pick the cloud of their choice. They put down a P card and go run with it. And then unfortunately, the CIO has to then deal with it down the road and at great expense. Um, and a lot of times that also happens from mergers and acquisitions. So an acquisition would happen, a customer would be historically on AWS, and they acquire a company that's on Google, and now we got to figure out how to bring it together. Um, been doing a lot of analysts and research. I don't know if Brian's around here anymore, but we, we're, we're hearing a lot of this, right? So, um, but the one case, or probably one of the best cases of why um, you do want to do multi-cloud beyond, oh, I don't want all my eggs in one basket, which is definitely a case, but um, is that there is a service that is differentiating, that is unique, 
that locks you in really well, but you're okay with it because the value it provides. And all for that, right? And that's where, you know, lock in, you're always gonna get locked in. Even open source locks you in, right? But the trick is, don't be locked in gratuitously. And if you're gonna be locked in, understand why and exploit it. Does anybody else have multi-cloud? That's willing to talk about it. <laughs> yeah, you do? We have to build software for multiple machine architectures. So we have to be able to deploy to IBM Cloud. Uh, you know, we spin things up in AWS. We spin up VMware VMs that simulate win Windows machines, all sorts of stuff. <laughs> Does anybody else do development work in different environments like that? Yeah? Would you like to share? But, so at Crunchy Data, we uh, support running in Azure, Amazon, and Google Cloud. We build for all of those. Um, and also uh, based off of Vets 80 sets an arm. So uh, as a solution, as architect, I have to go into all of those to establish environments, to replicate uh, any issues that customers may be experiencing. So we spend uh, a lot of time in those three environments. Thank you. I know, and, and I'm up here, so I can't I'll tell a funny story it. if you wanna hear one. Yes, please, tell About a story. About software supply chain, that Rob and I discussed earlier. So uh, I grew up at Red Hat, not since I was a baby, but like when I came to Red Hat, I grew up at Red Hat in the public sector. And so I've done a lot of um, work with various government agencies, civilian, Department of Defense, intelligence community, and boy, oh boy, do they love their binders and volumes of S-bombs and uh, wrapping themselves up in NIST 853v4 and you know all kinds of things like that. And, uh, I would say a typically progressive civilian agency that shall be not shall not be named, but likes to put a lot of things on planets and wants to get us, you know, the stars. Is um, we were talking about a software supply chain with them and making one more trusted. So the idea of a software supply chain is nothing new, right? The idea of adding trust and securing it and automating it is newish, but something that we've been describing for years. And um, we are demonstrating to them that by having are leveraging guardrails as part of their build, deploy, run pipeline. You know, the gates that you go through would supply more information about their software build, deploy, and run process and what's actually going on than they've ever had before. And it would be automated, it would be in beautiful dashboards for them, all wrapped up and completely consumable. But they wanted their binders of information to the point where we're like, okay, so you mean you want us to print all this stuff out, like PDFs? Like, yes. Do you know what, you know, CICD means? Well, I guess, what does it mean? Well, it's continuous, which means you're always doing it, so a thousand times a day, maybe, right? Do you have any idea how many binders we create? What do you have against trees? Do you want to slash and burn the rainforest? I mean, it was a pretty crazy kind of discussion, and to the point where eventually we kind of got past it, but I think for a lot of these technologies, and, and that we're discussing today and new ways of doing things. And this is a story as old as dirt. We have to kind of let go of the old ways and kind of accept the new ways. Um, otherwise, we're just hobbling ourselves. Um, and I think there's, we think about what people motivate. So I've done a lot of work with like, you know, uncovering what motivates the people in these IT shops, right? To do certain things certain ways and blocking or unblocking, what have you. And never forget that the uh, uh, most expensive part of IT is people, right? And there's a lot of people out there who do, everybody, heard, everybody do test-driven development, right? Or should be? Raise your hand, maybe, maybe not. You guys know what RDD is? Resume-driven development. So, right, so there's a lot, of, a lot of folks out there who are doing RDD, including the guys that are filling these binders up and supposedly reading them and putting them on the shelves. And, so anyway, we got through it, convinced them that the automating this out just allows you to focus on higher order things. You don't have to, we're not, no one's losing a job, et cetera. But, 
Um, further down the road, I was doing some stuff for a Department of Defense customer. And we were, I was telling this exact same story, because I like to tell the story. I like to talk. I'm in sales, so. Um, and I was describing something even earlier in my career, and back forward, we got to the binder, binder discussion, and he goes, you know, we've known this has been a problem for years, that nobody really reads these things. And this guy said, was telling me, I was like, I put in one of these binders, this was manually created years ago, if you read this, email me and I will give you $100. And I was put into one of the binders of, and he goes, it took like five years before I actually got the email. So, you know, it's this idea of like, I can't remember who said this, but um, compliance um, is not necessarily secure, right? Just like having the binders, right? That's compliant. But secure is compliant. And it, that's a lot of what we're doing here. We're talking about better ways to make, making, you know, in terms of the software supply chain, making yourself compliant. But you got to kind of, again, let go of those older ways.